Hello and welcome. The purpose of this lecture is to address sociological theories and how we can apply them to juvenile delinquency. But of course, as with always, we need to take that biopsychosocial approach. So again, if we're looking at biological theories such as the role of testosterone in aggression and violence, there are associations there. If we look at psychological theories, like what are people thinking? What are they observing? Um, you know, how does their brain function? That's that realm. But again, for this class, since we're in sociology, I'm going to try to kind of limit this discussion to more of a sociological approach. And again, if we're going to do a sociological approach, we probably need a quick overview of the three major theories. And then all of these kind of follow under those. So first we have our structural functionalist theory. And again, for this, we're gonna be look at how, looking at how institutions in society structure our lives and how institutions may be associated with crime. For example, if the institutions of society are not meeting the needs of society, does crime increase? If the economy crashes, how does that affect the family? You know, is that associated with juvenile delinquency if they find an increase in poverty? Um, you know, things along those lines. And so that's what we're going to be talking about with functionalism, looking at systems that structure our lives, these institutions that structure our lives and how they're associated with crime. And then we're also going to be looking at conflict theories such as inequality, group versus group. You know, if there's large inequality and there's high rates of poverty, for example, does that increase rates of crime? And then symbolic interaction is this theories. Um, that's actually a whole chapter on that next lecture. Um, so I'm going to kind of preserve conflict theory and symbolic next for next time. This one's going to heavily focus on structural functionalism. But symbolic interactionism, we'll talk about how we're the ones who built this social world. We're the ones who build these institutions. We're the ones who structure the lives of other people through the criminal justice system, through institutions like the family, things along those lines. You know, and so that's that idea. We're gonna take those last two theories for the next lecture. This one, we're gonna be looking at more uh, theories that fall into that functionalist perspective, looking at how institutions are associated with juvenile delinquency. Okay, so first and foremost, learning objectives. We're gonna be talking about social disorganization theory, cultural deviance approach, strain and opportunity theories, uh, differential association theories, drift theories, control theories, um, integrated theoretical explanations, which is like combining different theories into one, which again, it's like biopsychosocial. You put all these theories together to really account for what's happening. And then again, we need to, summarize some of the goals and research strategies and you know some of this will be in your book you guys will get a lot of this on the quizzes i'm not going to go too deep uh into all the specific research here i just want to give like a general overview of the theories um, but your book has like a little story and all of that for each item here so definitely be looking through those as you're reading the chapter okay so first in order to understand like a structural functionalist approach we have to ask questions like what are social structures and it took me a long time to wrap my head around this idea of what a social structure is because it's so abstract so usually i think about it as something that enables or blocks you the education system enables you if you can get through it and get a degree but if you can't get through it and you don't get a degree it blocks you access from certain jobs for example okay your parents could be a structure in your life, right? Until you're 18 years old, they have whatever rights that blend between the state and the parents have that control over you, <laughs> okay? They are structures, obstacles in your life that can enable you, can give you food, can give you warmth and comfort, but at the same time, they can block you and punish you, uh, for example, if need be. Not that I'm a proponent of punishment. I'm definitely the reinforcement kind of theorist when it comes to psychology, you know, because again, reinforcement tends to get, you know, teaches better behavior. And, you know, we'll talk about a lot about that a little bit later on, the difference between reinforcement and punishment when it comes to how do you kind of solve problems of juvenile delinquency. Um, but again, reinforcement is you teach behaviors, you know, you, you know, you guide people into the behaviors that you want them, whereas punishment just blocks the behavior without necessarily teaching you. And so structures officially, formally, are always defined something like this, though. 
They are stable, formal, and informal arrangements that characterize a society, including its economic arrangements, social institutions, values, and norms. So again, think about the culture you live in. How do the ideologies, values, and norms structure your behavior, your ideas about what's right and wrong, things along those lines? How does the economy structure your behavior? Why are you in college in the first place? Because you live in a capitalist economy and you're hoping that if you get this education, it'll get you a better job. Therefore, the education system and the capitalist economy are structuring your decisions, even if it's an unconscious process, okay? So again, social structure shapes human behavior, okay, and is related to delinquency by way of such factors as poverty, racial disparity, disorganized communities, unemployment. Again, what happens when the economy crashes? How does that affect the family? If you have more kids in child poverty, like you always hear the uh, stories of New York in the late 1800s and early 1900s of these child gangs running around, right? But again, where are their parents? Probably in some factory working for peanuts at the mercy of the bourgeoisie factory owners if they weren't in the factories themselves, for example. You know, why do mobsters commit crimes? Is it because like they need to live a lifestyle they don't have access to because they don't have the status, so therefore they find an alternative means of getting what they want? Okay, and so your book has all kinds of cool pictures that I posted throughout this to kind of discuss these theories like social disorganization theory, which we're going to talk about next. Uh, but like social disorganization theory is a prime example. What happens when you have socially disorganized neighborhoods? neighborhoods full of crime, a culture that's lower class, and your book gets deep into this, right? So in lower class culture, do you see rise of drugs and crime and things along those lines? And this is not to stigmatize, but to point out that as Bordeaux 1994 would say, your social class is associated with your habitus, your cultural way of life. And so again, the way you're socialized, the way you're brought up, the what you're exposed to highly influences the decisions you make and the way you end up living your life. And so whether or not we want to admit it, growing up in poverty is associated with an increased risk of going to jail, for example. Being non-white is associated with an increased risk of being to going to jail more than someone who's white, for example. Okay, you know. And so again, what if there's no opportunity structure in your neighborhood? What if it's poor and there's no access to jobs and you don't have any money? What are you going to do if you're starving? You know, is that a point where you're like the heck with it? And then maybe you make a decision you might regret later because you end up in prison, but maybe you were hungry at the time. So again, social disorganization theory, you have these socially disorganized neighborhoods, a failure of informal social controls, meaning like you don't have maybe high quality parental values or education systems or police that are actually creating positive behavior. You have increased gang activity, for example, cultural delin transmission of delinquent traditions. Again, it's like that street life, but where are you gonna get exposed to the street life when you're not in school, when you're not going to the good schools, for example. And then these are all associated with things like increased delinquent behavior. So the concentric zones, zones of Chicago is a prime example of it, right? So your book goes kind of deep into this, and this is kind of was on our learning outcomes, learning come, outcome aid. I don't want to go too deep into it, but again, if you go to any city, you can see how cities are broken out, right? You got your wealthy neighborhoods, your middle class neighborhoods, and your poor neighborhoods, okay? So like if you go to Cleveland, for example, on the northwest side of Cleveland is Millionaire Row along the lake. Then you kind of go into the artsy district around 25th Street. Then you get into the downtown epicenter. And then if you keep going east along into the lake, you get into Painter's Alley or whatever that's called. Uh, Playhouse Square, that's it, where they have the big chandelier. And then you have like the, the colleges kind of growing up and another art district kind of booming there. But by the time you get to 55th Street on the east side, it's a completely different planet. Like you are literally in the hood. And then from 55th Street all the way down to Cuyahoga is incredibly rough. Abandoned neighborhoods, people have left. And so again, what happens when your town loses its jobs like Cleveland did and loses all that tax money like Cleveland did? And you don't have as much money for your education system like Cleveland did? Do you see a rise in crime in the inner cities, things along those lines, right? And so 
every city is kind of broken out this way. It's all kind of segregated based upon race, based upon socioeconomic status, you know, and all of these factors then play into who's more likely to commit crimes. So again, social disorganization theory looks at things like macro social forces, these larger structures like migration patterns, segregated neighborhoods, um, what's the economy like, you know, is there housing discrimination by race, by social class, um, is there a higher concentration of poverty, family disruption, are you constantly moving, are you renting, or do you own, okay, all of these can play into the social environment that can play into whether or not juveniles commit crimes, and we don't want to necessarily say that because that's a harsh reality, but I mean, not being in poverty has advantages. It has privileges. I mean, brain growth in general is associated with, did you eat today? And so what happens is those that don't become connected, that don't tap into the act, get access to resources, don't get into the education system, don't get that status, don't get that capital, what happens when you're not connected to society? You might experience what Durkheim called as anime, this normlessness, this disconnect from the cultural social norms that would normally structure our life. And if you don't buy into the system, okay, and you get disconnected, right, then does the social organization break down essentially because people aren't buying into the norms and then you see rise in crime and things along those lines and so the, the book talks about things like loss of regulation was particularly likely when society and its members experienced rapid change and laws did not keep pace so again like early america gangs in new york kind of stuff rise of the mafia uh, rise of drug cultures, rise of inner city crimes in the 90s, things along those lines, okay? And so this theory, the social disorganization theory, part of functionalist theory, says that delinquency results from a breakdown in these mechanisms, these institutions of social control and a disruption in the social order. So again, if you end up with mass inequality, mass poverty, breakdown in the family, breakdown in the economy, breakdown in the education system, all of these factors contribute to whether or not crime increases or decreases, okay? And so your book talks about an ecological perspective, which is looking at the relationship between social disorganization and delinquency. Is there an association, a relationship, a correlation between poverty and crime and race and crime and all of these factors? Yes. But again, it's some of it's confounding. Like, why is race associated with crime? But what happens when you stick an entire race of people in poverty? You're going to see higher rates of crime. And then if you stick people in a culture of poverty and then socialize them from generation to generation and then block them access from getting a house, from owning their own house and passing down wealth to their children, that's what you're going to find. So more theories for a couple more. Differential opportunity structure theory is one of my favorites because it's interesting. It basically says the types of crimes you commit are based upon what you have access to. So again, like I said with Bordeaux and Habitus, depending upon your socioeconomic status, your social location in the class system, that's associated with what type of crime you have access to. Like you often hear like white collar crime versus blue collar or street crime. White collar crime is like you know, stealing stocks, the Enron scandals, um, fraud, you know, all of that kind of stuff that only rich people who work in offices, who have titles, can even have access to. And then you have lower class crime like drug dealing, burglary, uh, assault. You're going to see much more higher rates of that. So again, if you control for juvenile delinquency and socioeconomic status, you'll see differentials in the types of crimes that are committed. Cultural transmission theory is very important, and this says that basically you are socialized by society, groups of people, these agents of socialization, whether it's your parents, your peers, your friends, the education system, the media, you are socialized into a cultural way of life. Therefore, your norms about what are acceptable and what are not acceptable are often not even your own ideas. You don't just come up with most of your ideologies in life. You hear it, you internalize it, 
you process it, you organize it in your brain. But again, like you've probably been told your whole life that you're white or black or Asian, right? And you just absorb that like, okay, I'm white, black or Asian or Native American or whatever. But are you? Have you ever looked at the biology of race? I mean, the first time I ever questioned whether I was a white person was like really mind blowing to me. But again, it's because I was the cultural transmission of race in our society. We socialize all kids to learn what racial category they belong to and which box to check without even questioning it. You know, and that's the same thing, right? If you're socialized around a bunch of people that are all doing drugs and that's normal, are you going to think it's normal? If you grow up where people are just doing petty crimes and stealing stuff, are you going to think that's normal? And so again, depending upon the culture, that dictates your social norms as to what's acceptable. And if you're not buying into the dominant culture of following the laws and things along those lines, then you might see higher rates of crime. Okay, cultural deviance theory. What happens when you deviate from social norms? Okay, social norms themselves are socially constructed. It's us that labels something a crime. Like it's nothing's really a crime in nature until we label it one. Okay, and so again, the street culture may have a completely different attitude than upper class culture when it comes to crime. Like maybe street culture is like whatever, you know, that's just some petty stuff, some petty robbery, whereas upper class culture would never even think of committing something like that. You know, that's something that your book talked about. And I don't know if I agree with that or not, but there's a lot of things in this book that sometimes you want to argue against. So that's one of my thoughts there. But strain theory is incredibly important. Strain theory is basically like, do you have needs that are unfulfilled? So if social institutions are not fulfilling your needs, are you more likely to commit crimes to achieve your goals? Hence my theory of like the mob or like what happens if you're starving, you know? And so these are just questions. And so, but these, a little bit later, we'll talk about how you can blend these theories. But again, if you take something like cultural deviance theory, cultural transmission theory and strain theory and put them all together and apply it to like the Vikings, right? The Vikings needed to either expand their empire or they needed whatever they needed. So they got in their boats and they went over to England and they, you know, went to war and conquered, you know, were they deviant? So the Vikings going over and conquering wasn't deviant. deviant. Getting a sword and maybe killing somebody along the way to them wasn't deviant. But again, they were also strained in a sense that they had some needs that were unfulfilled. And so they had to go out and get what they want because their society wasn't fulfilling at the time. So they had to make some changes and hence get on their boats and go places. Okay. But I like to apply strain theory to things like poverty and things like why would people commit crimes based upon needs. Okay, institutional anime theory goes back to what I was talking about earlier. If you're disconnected from the means of production, if you're disconnected from society, from good jobs, from the education system, from, you know, high quality culture that like, you know, raises you up in a positive way so you can live a happy life, all of those things, will that result in you becoming disconnected from society and then coming up with your own cultural norms to, you know, kind of guide your life, so to speak. Okay. Delinquent subcultures theory, again, each society can be broken down into subcultures. Some people follow the laws and some don't. So again, depending upon the types of groups that you're exposed to, the cultures that you're exposed to, that's associated with uh, whether or not you can maybe are at more risk for crimes. Over here on the right, look at these in your book. Because like this is Miller's theory of lower class culture. What happens when you stick an entire culture of pop, people, of a whole group of people into a culture of poverty, how does it affect that? Um, here's Cohen's theory of delinquent subcultures. What happens when you get exposed to subcultures that commit crimes? And then Merton's strain theory over here, again, needs aren't fulfilled by the institutions. That affects our decision-making and our behavior in the social context, which then increases the likelihood of committing crimes. Opportunity theory, again, goes along with what I was saying with differentials. Association theory, you know, when the opportunity arises, what types of opportunities arise, what influences whether or not you make that decision. Um, again, differential association theory falls into the cultural norm theory. I mean, there's a lot of blend with all these theories. Differential association theory is basically if your friends are all doing it and they think it's normal, 
you know, are you really going to think it's abnormal? And then drift theory is interesting. The book talks about with drift theory how teenagers may be just kind of constantly on the brink. Some days they're following the rules. Some days they're not. And again, how are the institutions in society like our family, the justice system, the education system, uh, other agents of socialization, how are we guiding these individuals toward making decisions that aren't destructive and resulting in increased rates of crime? Control theory is fantastic. This is an important one. Um, control theory asks the question, do we need control? What happens if we don't have institutions in society to control social behavior? You know what I mean? Like what happens if there is no law? What happens if there's no parents to guide you and structure you? So do we all need some form of control? Or if we don't have control, you know, like in the form of a police, are we all going to have to sleep with guns under our pillow? Because you know who's going to never know who's going to break into your house. That's that theory. And then social control theory, again, feeds into this. These are just, you know, all major theories and subheading theories, all under functionalist theory that go on for days. Social control theory really focuses, again, like, it's us that creates the institutions. It's us interacting with each other that can be structures to each other's behavior, so to speak. And so again, it's us that can create a society to structure behavior, to block certain behaviors that we can't have that are deemed dysfunctional in society. Like you can't have people just going around raping people. We need some laws. If I mean, because humans left unchecked it's in their genetics, they have the capacity to rape, right? So do we need forms of social control? And so us as a society have created institutions to hopefully protect against rape. As we're finding the institutions are failing when it comes to protect against rape. However, that's a completely different conversation, okay? But still, we need some institutions for protection or whatever it might be, or just to, you know, so society can be stable and predictable. If you have a bunch of crime running around, society is unstable. If your institutions aren't holding up the needs of society, society becomes unstable. And again, so functionalist theory basic is we create social institutions to maintain a stable society so that it's in balance and you have that nice equilibrium and it's not in chaos, okay? And so that's the idea of social control theory. And then just to kind of wrap up, uh, integrated theories is, again, how do you blend all these theories in one? One theory is never enough. You always have to think about all these different approaches, right? Like if I'm talking about race, why was race created? From a functionalist perspective, Europeans created the institution of race so they could divide society into social classes, and then your race dictated what social class you were allowed to be in. From a conflict theory, Race was created so that Europeans could dominate the class system, and so they created racial categories to subjugate people into the lower classes. Symbolic interactionist theory were the ones who created racial categories in the first place, okay? They don't exist in nature. Nobody's actually genetically white, black, or Asian. We created the categories for whatever purposes we created them for. And so integrated theories are like that. Like the general theory of crime looks at things like self-control. But in order to understand ideas of self-control, we have to understand biological factors. How does the body influence how much control you actually have? Because again, even though you're awake, you're not, uh, you're not conscious. Your unconscious mind is driving the car all the time. Think about some fight you had with your significant other. Have you ever acted out or like with a friend and just acted out and been kind of out of control? or had a temper tantrum with your parents, for example, how much self-control do humans really have? So again, that's maybe we need institutions of society to impose control. Otherwise, you have a bunch of people trying to self-regulate and how well is that gonna hold up? But I like general theory of crime too, because for me, you have to, input, you have to put all of the, you know, so how much of self-control is associated with whether or not the institutions are doing their job? How much of self-control is associated with whether or not your parents raised you in such a way that you can function in society? Okay, interactional theory, looking at things like all the complex social interactions between our groups and the cultures and our neighborhoods and the education system and how that's associated with it. Social development model, how are institutions and society associated with the way we psychologically develop? Okay, like I teach developmental psychology in all the stages and 
you know, those teen years are especially important because what you're influenced by, what you're exposed to, how much you're challenged, these can all structure so many of your outcomes in later life, okay? And so again, development model though, you have to consider the bio biology of the body, how it's growing, hormones, the structure of the brain. For social development model, we gotta think about the psychological growth of the prefrontal cortex and the front and all the lobes of our brain. And it's just so complex. And then social development model, nature versus nurture you're always thinking about how the social context structures you as an individual so this is just a quick introduction to some functionalist theories we'll do some long-winded conflict and symbolic interactionism next time just to rock it out uh, but again thank you for your patience and have a wonderful day